Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to this work workshop on machine learning and dynamical systems. Um, I'll be talking about using dynamical systems to do machine learning. And this is a joint work with uh, Jie Chun Han, Chen Xiao Li, Chao Ma, and Lei Wu, and all of whom are my former students. Uh, Jie Chun and Lei Wu are in Princeton right now, and Chen Xiao is in Singapore, and Chao Ma is in Stanford. But before I get into this uh, specific topic, let me make some general remarks about um, this, the theme of this workshop, namely machine learning and dynamical systems. Um, so I, I would suggest that, um, that, that there, there are three components of machine learning and dynamical systems. M machine learning of dynamical systems, by dynamical systems, for dynamical systems. So machine learning of dynamical systems. So this is, the, we're trying to learn a small dynamical system from a much bigger, complicated dynamical systems. So this is a typical thing we do in model reduction. Um, the issues here are short-term accuracy, short-term meaning order one time scale accuracy, and long-term qualitative consistency. So over long time, it's very hard to expect quantitative accuracy, but we want the smaller dynamic system to have qualitative behavior uh, in the same way as the, the original big, huge dynamical systems. Um, one example is the ANZAC net. This is going to be talked given by uh, Haijun Yi. Machine learning by dynamical system. This is using dynamical systems to perform machine learning. This is the main theme of my talk. And here um, we use dynamical systems to create the functions, nonlinear functions that we use uh, as trial functions in the hypothesis space for machine learning. So in this case, because we used the dynamical systems to generate the hypothesis space, we can formulate the learning problem as a problem in control theory. And then we can uh, develop algorithms motivated by control theory. Machine learning for dynamical systems. So here, the, here we are interested in some particular observation data. And typically, it's in the form of time series, say, the drag over a, 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 a wing of an airplane. And we just want to predict accurate prediction of that data. So in this case, one thing we can do is to use current, uh, recurrent neural networks. But we all know training recurrent neural networks is a very complicated problem, and there are many mathematical issues. And that's the talk that I'll give, him, that I'll give by uh, Chen Xiao immediately after my talk. OK, so let me start with, with um, a typical example that we have in mind in machine learning. So this is the problem of supervised learning. We're given some data here. Um, X is the data point. Y is the label. Y is called the label. And the label is given by some unknown function f star at the data point. And our task is to learn, namely to approximate f star. So using this data. So a typical example is follows. This is the very uh, well-known CIFAR 10 data set. So the data set consists of a collection of images. And the images are labeled into 10 categories according to what's on the image. For example, these are, the, these are birds, these are cats, these are, these are dogs, stuff like that. So our task is to um, learn a function f star defined on all these images that maps each image to its category. Each image can, is a 32 by 32 pixel image. So um, it can be viewed as a point in 32 by 32 by 10 dimensional space Three, uh, by, uh, by three, sorry, by three dimensional space. Three here stands for the dimension of color. So this is, uh, the, so the, the function of star is a function defined on a 3072 dimensional space. The, the, the function is discrete value in this case. The value takes uh, 10 values. Okay, so what do we do in deep learning? is typically um, this uh, so-called DNN-SGD paradigm. DNN stands for Deep Neural Network. SGD stands for Stochastic Gradient Descent. So this paradigm consists of three components. One is the hypothesis space. This is the space of trial functions that we use to approximate F star. And this is typically, uh, this is a typical example of a hypothesis space. Namely, we have a, a two-layer neural network here. So two-layer uh, 
refers to the fact that we have two layers of coefficients, aj and, and uh, wj. So our, <coughs> we're going to use, uh, we, we're going to tune these coefficients to fit the data. Sigma here is a nonlinear activation function. A very popular example is this nonlinear active, uh, this nonlinear function called ReLU function. The second component is, choose, is to choose a um, loss function and convert our problem into an optimization problem. So a very popular choice is this empirical risk. Since we're fitting the data, we try to fit the data, we want to minimize this empirical risk. And this uh, empirical risk is a, an average of n terms, each term representing one data point in the training data set. The third component is to choose an optimization algorithm to, to find optimized uh, parameters. So the simplest optimization algorithm, algorithm is the gradient descent algorithm. If you do gradient descent, you have to calculate this average in order to calculate the gradient. And that's expensive, particularly when n is large. And typically in modern machine learning, n is typically large. So an idea that's very popular right now is to re replace the sum by a random sample from this uh, collection of terms. And that's called SGD. And SGD performs very well and, uh, and sometimes even performs better than GD. And it's the um, algorithm of choice to, um, to perform this optimization problem. OK, so let me give you a hint. Why? Let me try to give you a hint why neural networks work in a very high dimension. So let's start. Let's, let's start by looking at the classical approach, namely Fourier approximation. So imagine our target function is given by this Fourier transform. So A would be the Fourier transform of F star. So for this expression, a typical thing to do is to approximate by a fast Fourier transform, so which means replace this integral by the sum, where omega j is a, a, a set of uniform grid points. And then you can do this by F of t. Now, this works very, very well for smooth functions in low dimension, but it does not work at all in high dimension. And the reason being that the error in this approximation has this expression, asymptotic scales like this, where m is the number of terms. Now, here, alpha typically measures the degree of smoothness of f star. d is the dimensionality. If you want to reduce the error to an error tolerance of epsilon, then the number of parameters needed is given by this expression here. So let's take this, an example where alpha is equal to 1, just for simplicity, and epsilon is equal to 0.1, then m scales like 10 to the d. If d is equal to 3,000, this is a huge number. Certainly, this is impossible. So that explains why classical approximation on fixed, based on fixed grids namely um, spectral methods, finite difference, finite elements, all these methods don't work in high dimension. Now, what should we expect in high dimension? Well, one thing we can do very well in high dimension is integration using the Monte Carlo method. In that case, the convergence rate scale like, scales like m to the one half, independent of dimensionality. So this is sort of the golden standards for high dimension problems. And we should keep that in mind. Now, now that's integration. Now we, we have a problem in the function approximation. But imagine that f star is given by this expression. The only difference between this expression and the previous expression of Fourier transform is that it would replace d omega by pi of d omega, where pi is the probability distribution. So, in this case, f star can be expressed as this, as this expectation. Now, to approximate this expectation, we can do Monte Carlo. Namely, we take an ID sample of pi, omega j, now denotes the ID sample of pi, and then we approximate f star by this empirical sum. The error, the variance of the error, is exactly given by uh, is given by this expression exactly. And you can see that this is, this is the typical situation in Monte Carlo. Now, notice that this expression here can be written as, 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 as this, where aj is just a omega j. 
and sigma is the nonlinear function e to the iz. And this is nothing but a two-layer neural network with this particular activation function. So this little argument explains that if a function can be expressed as this expectation, then it can be approximated by two-layer neural networks with a, with a convergence rate, with an error rate that's like Monte Carlo. In particular, that's independent of dimension. Now, this can be um, extended to general nonlinear scalar uh, activation functions. So let sigma for, uh, uh, be a nonlinear, general nonlinear scalar function. Assume that f star is given by this expression. So it's uh, given by an expectation of this form. Then same argument as before uh, shows that f star can be approximated, approximated by a two layer neural network with a convergence rate, which is the same as Monte Carlo. Okay, so in this case, we call this, we call this f star given by this expression, an integral transform based representation of f star. So this is representing f star as an integral transform based representation. And so these kinds of expectation, representations might be a bit special. You might see, this, this might seem a bit special at this point, but let me remark that um, behind the neural network models, there's always some sort of expectation structure. And that's, uh, I'm gonna explain, explain that for the residual networks uh, in the next slide, no, in, 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 in a minute. Now, before I do that, let me mention that there are lots of mathematical issues uh, in uh, machine learning, uh, typically having to do uh, how we deal with functions in high dimension. For example, we need to develop an approximation theory in high dimension. Um, but in particular, we're interested in obtaining Monte Carlo kind of error rates. That can, that obviously that can only happen with a particular class of machine learning models with particular target functions. And we need to understand for a particular machine learning model, what kind of target functions would give, would can be approximated with a, with a Monte Carlo rate. And that's, a, that's an approximation theory. And in addition, because we only have finite piece of data, we need to analyze the so-called training error, which is roughly speaking the difference between training error, uh, we, sorry, we need to an, an, uh, analyze what is called the estimation error, which is uh, roughly the difference between training error and testing error. And, and also, uh, we need to understand um, the training algorithm. As a matter of fact, Typical machine learning models are trained, are trained with stochastic gradient descent type of algorithms. And that's a re relatively simple algorithm to, 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 to use for a seemingly complicated task. Um, for example, in molecular dynamics, you would never imagine using gradient descent algorithms to do optimization, because if you do that, you'll get stuck at the very bad local minima very quickly. And that's not what happens in machine learning. So why is this the case? And that's a very important issue that needs to be understood. So not all of these are uh, question, uh, questions have been understood thoroughly. Certainly we're quite far from being able to understand this thoroughly, but there's some sort of a picture that's, uh, that's beginning to emerge. And that's described, and that's described by this um, review article um, written here, and it's just posted on the archive today. Okay, let me now uh, come to multi-layer neural networks. And this is a typical picture you see in multi-layer neural networks where this stands for the input layer. So we have input variables, x1, x2, x3. And this stands for the output layer. That's the function we produce out of this neural network. The function, that, and then these guys, these links are the parameters, you know, w0, and you know, all the way, um, okay, and this is WL. So we have L layer, uh, uh, L groups of parameters. And the function we produce in this case <coughs> is given by this expression, where sigma is the activation function. Um, and this, uh, and 
uh, this no little notation circle means that the scalar active x function, when it's acted on a vector, is acted component-wise. OK, so this is the typical neural network. And we can re express this neural network function as this discrete dynamical system. So z0 z is just this guy. And then f will be, uh, uh, zk will be given by zk minus 1 from this expression. Here, there should be a circle here. And then the last layer the, uh, is, uh, gives the, the, the function, the neural network function. So our task is to choose the parameters w, all these w's, to fit the data. So this can be interpreted as a control problem. This idea goes back to Lacombe, who used the control problem to, uh, to explain uh, back propagation. So in the control problem setting, the z's would be the states, the w's are the parameters, uh, are the controls, and the empirical risk is the objective function. Now, um, the dynamical system viewpoint um, can be intuitively, uh, can be uh, helpful, helpful intuitively. For example, um, let's think about the following. Uh, in in uh, gradient descent, we need to calculate the gradient. The gradient is given by uh, roughly by the by by the product of these matrices, and there are sigmas in between. So there are sigma primes in between. So in in these dots. So if we if think about this product of, but roughly it, you can think of this as a product of these matrices. You know, if you have a product of these matrices, um, there's um, um, Multiplicative ergodic theorem, which tells you that that it, it behaves like um, uh, some number kappa to the lth power, and this number kappa is bit, is like the Lyapunov exponent, a typical notion in in the dynamical systems. And if kappa is bigger than one, then this expression explodes um, exponentially fast. And that's the that's a um, uh, that's an, a numerical instability and, and explains why it's sometimes hard to train uh, multi-layer, you know, many-layer uh, fully connected neural network models. So you want to make sure that kappa is very close to one. And how do you do that? One way of doing that is this residual network model in which we don't update z, but we only update the increment in z. So this will be the update. The or, in the original residual network model, there's no scaling factor one over L. I, um, a few years ago, I tried to interpret this as the discretization, time discretization of some continuous time model, in which case you would naturally have this one over L here. And it's not understood the difference between, uh, uh, between the, the resonance with or without this scaling factor. And that's, I think, an interesting problem to look at. Okay, so I'm going to, from now on, I'm going to take a continuous viewpoint because that's uh, mathematically more convenient. Okay, the continuous viewpoint is proposed by um, myself, uh, Harbour, and Risotto, and later on, um, um, it's, it's, it's right now more popularly known as a neural ODE model. Okay, so here the idea is that let's consider a dynamical system, nonlinear dynamic system with different right-hand sides. Now, each, for each such a right-hand side, the dynamical system produces a time one map, and that's a nonlinear map. And if we take a contraction of that map with some uh, vector, we get a scalar function. And, and these scalar functions can be viewed as trial functions to be used in a hypothesis space to fit the data and approximate the f-star. So this is the uh, dynamical system viewpoint to machine learning. Now, an obvious question is, how do we choose the G, the right-hand side? OK, now, in order to answer that question, let's think about the following sort of ResNet model. So this will be a scaled ResNet model. And, and, and here, we started with a, a, an identity map, and then we want to update the identity map by uh, update the, the sequence of the transformations by this very small amount. So you can view this as a sequence of near identity transformations. 
And the transformation, the update in the transformation is given by this expression where the A's and then W's are IID random vectors sampled from a fixed distribution row. So consider this sequence of near identity transformations. The a theorem when proof is the following. Under some moment conditions for the, um, for the probability distribution row, as L goes to infinity, this sequence of near identity transformations converges to, the, to a continuous limit given by this OD, set of ODE, by this ODE, where the right hand side is given by this expression. Okay, now note that this expression is nothing but the integral transform representation that we discussed earlier. If you look at this thing here, it's the integral transform representation that we discussed earlier. So this theorem suggests that the right choice of G is nothing but the integral transform representation of Z. Now here, this theorem is proved for a fixed distribution rho. But if you let rho depends on uh, the total time tau uh, continuously, nicely, the same theorem can be proved. So we're going to choose um, this, we're going to choose the, 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 the G to be this kind of expression where rho may depend on tau. As a matter of fact, we're going to formulate <coughs> a slightly more general choice of G, where this is replaced by more general feature function phi. So we're going to consider this slightly more general form. Namely, phi is um, some sort of a feature function where u stands for the, uh, u is a parameter for the features, and rho tau is a one parameter family of probability distribution. And let's consider this dynamical system. Z would be the states, and rho would be the control at time tau. And we want to op, uh, choose the control so that the, the population risk, the so called population risk, is minimized. And f is given by this uh, contraction. Here. So this is a control problem. And the control is given by this family of probability distribution. For, the, for this control problem, we can formulate Poincaré as a maximum principle. To do that, let's define this Hamiltonian, where the Hamiltonian is defined on the states and co-state and control space. And control is the probability distribution. And P2 stands for probability distributions with finite second moments. So this is the definition of the control. It's um, uh, just the standard extension. Uh, it's just the Hamiltonian extended to, to this context here. And then Pontragia maximum principle, principle claims that for each Soto time tau, the optimal control is an argmax of this expected Hamiltonian, where Z and, and P are the states and co-states that's uh, defined by this forward and backward uh, equation. So this will be, uh, this, is, this, this is the standard forward and backward equation. It's, it's in the form of a Hamiltonian system. And then the, uh, and the boundary condition is, uh, is given here. So, <coughs> so this is the Pondrange maximum principle. It can be understood as the KKT condition for this control uh, for this optimization problem with constraints. The constraints is, def is defined by this set of ODEs. And this particular case, the KKT can condition can be strengthened a little bit in the form, in the following form, namely, um, namely that um, one can claim that rho, the optimal control, is actually a maximizer for each sort of time tau. Okay, now one can develop already uh, algorithms using this maximum principle. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. But before I do that, I want to first make a connection with, the, with, with the, the typical thing, the standard thing that's done in deep learning, namely gradient descent based algorithm or SGD based algorithm. In order to do that, let me try to write down the continuous version of gradient descent. So what will be the control, uh, continuous version of gradient descent that minimize this optimal control here, uh, this op, uh, objective function here. Well, 
note that the controls here are probability distributions. So in order to address that question, let me first write, try to write down the gradient descent dynamics, the gradient flow. So let's first ask the question, given a functional defined over some probability distribution pi, what is the gradient flow for the optimization of this functional? So let's follow a physics approach. Namely, we'll first define the chemical potential, which is just the standard variational gradient. And then from the variational gradient, uh, we can define the velocity using fixed law. But fixed law says velocity is proportional to force. And force, in this case, is given by its negative uh, gradient of the chemical potential. And with the velocity, you can write down the current. And then we can write down the continuity equation and this is the gradient flow dynamics for the optimization problem. And notice that it's well known that this is the same as the gradient flow of the original functional under the Wasserstein metric. So we're going to use, follow this recipe to define the gradient flow. In our case, we don't just have one probability distribution. We have a one parameter family of probability distribution indexed by the Soto time tau. So so um, following the same recipe, we have also one parameter family of, of gradient flow. That's this, that's this equation here. And for each gradient flow, there is a, a set of states and co-states solved by, uh, that solve this um, forward or backward equation. And then, um, and then uh, um, sorry, no, this, uh, sorry. These, these, these uh, states and co-states solve this, um, um, this uh, forward and backward equation. Okay, um, and this is the boundary condition. That's the same as the Pondragian maximum principle. As a matter of fact, compared with the Pondragian maximum principle, the only thing that changes is that this is replaced by the gradient flow. Okay, so now let's ask, so this is a set of continuous equations. Um, now let's ask, how do we discretize this in order to give us, um, to get a concrete algorithm that we can use? In order to do that, we have several things to do. One is that we replace the population risk by empirical risk. And this is done uh, easily, just use the training data. And then if we look at, go back to this uh, forward and backward equation, in Soto time tau, we can discretize this by a forward and backward Euler. And this gives us this set of equations. And then last, but not certainly not the least, we discretize this set of PDEs using the particle method. Namely, we replace rho tau, each rho tau, rho tau well, at this, uh, L is a discrete, discrete Soto time index here. So we replace this probability distribution by an empirical probability distribution centered on the set of particles. Okay, then this equation then, this gradient flow equation then, is actually equivalent to this set of ODEs. Okay, and one can check that this set of ODEs is nothing but the continuous form of the gradient descent algorithm for ResNet, you know, for scaled ResNet, where this is the forward propagation, this is the backward propagation, and that's the gradient descent dynamics in continuous time. So this says that if we take our continuous formulation here and discretize the continuous formulation using the most straightforward algorithms, namely forward and backward Euler, and then particle method, we recover the, the um, gradient descent algorithm for ResNet. And this philosophy not just hold, holds for, um, uh, for this particular case, it also holds for other neural network models. For example, for two-layer neural network models, we can write down the continuous formulation and then discretize using particle method. Um, one might ask, why particle method? Well, because the particle method is the analog of Monte Carlo in high dimension. This is the one numerical algorithm that works in high dimension. If you Think about filtering, high dimensional filtering, God, there's a particle filter. And that, that's not a coincidence. That's because high dimensions particle method is the thing that works. Um, you can also replace particle method by smooth particle method. That's a typical thing to do in numerical analysis. 
in which case um, um, uh, we, we just replace this delta function by an approximate delta function, such as a, you know, a Gaussian. And that re re results in a different algorithm. And, and uh, actually, that's an interesting idea to pursue. And, and I'll comment that at the end. So that's a, that's a connection with what's done, uh, the standard approach in deep learning. But control theory also suggests alternative algorithms, in particular, this maximum principle, sorry, this maximum princi principle here also suggests alternative algorithms. So here's an idea. In control theory, there is an algorithm called method of a successive approximation. And if we take, ad uh, uh, adopt that idea to this particular setting, we get this set of, uh, we get this algorithm. And namely, we solve these states and co-states and each um, pseudo time tau, we solve this optimization problem, okay? So that's the MSA algorithm from control theory. Now, it turns out this works, but it doesn't work so well. If we extend this idea slightly, this is the work uh, joined with, with Chen Xiaoli, uh, Long Chen, Kai Chen, and myself. If we extend it, if we extend this, um, this um, idea a little bit, namely if we define an extended state and co-state space by adding these auxiliary variables v and, rho, uh, v and q, and define this extended Hamiltonian, and here rho, by the way, here, there's an, okay, this notation is a little bit bad because rho should be, um, is, is, an, uh, is a penalty parameter, it's not the property distribution. I should have used uh, lambda here. Okay, so we add these penalty terms so that V is close to be F and Q is close to be um, um, minus gradient of H. So, 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 so V is close to this right hand side and Q is close to this right hand side. That's the idea of using this, uh, introducing these auxiliary variables. Now with this extended Hamiltonian, we can also define it the, the MSA algorithm, we call this extended MSA algorithm, and that works much better. So here's uh, two sets of numerical examples uh, for different initialization, and we're comparing the extended MSA with um, uh, grade, uh, stoch uh, stochastic gradient descent algorithms, the standard SGD, that's shown in, in light blue, uh, the Ad ADAM algorithm, uh, the, perhaps the, the most popular great uh, stochastic algorithms in deep learning. And that's shown in uh, yellow. And this other line, the, I would say the pink line is eta grad. So the first set of experiments is done for, um, for some kind of a good initialization. Good initialization here means that we initialize with a small, um, with a, with a small values of parameters. And in this, in this case, all the different algorithms perform relatively closely with a slight improvement of extended uh, MSA. But if you initialize with, a, with some bad initialization, so here bad initialization means that we initialize with some big initial set of uh, values of, of parameters, then the extended MSA performs much better than the stochastic gradient descent algorithms. So in terms, at least in terms of, um, uh, training loss and test loss as a function of iteration. Now in, war, in wall clock, the difference uh, is smaller and that is, could be due to many reasons. And one reason is the particular, uh, particular optimization algorithm that we use in, in order to implement extend MSA. So here we use limited memory BFGS. Okay, so now, but what's important is, that, is, is, is let's compare these two ideas. One is the maximum principle, one is gradient descent. Now notice that if we go back, if we go back to the maximum principle and look at this. So here there are two sort of extent, uh, expensive steps. One is this maximiz uh, maximization problem and one is the backward forward propagation problem. So these are the expensive steps. In um, maximum principle based, algorithm, the extended MSA, we perform for each 
backward forward propagation, we solve this optimization problem to convergence. Now, in the other algorithm, it's the opposite. Namely, for each forward backward propagation, we iterate, we solve this only for one step of the gradient descent. So we solve for only one step of this gradient flow. So we can put these together in the following way. So namely, for each forward backward propagation, let's ask, let k be the number of steps we do in optimization. So maximum principle based algorithm says that we basically take k to be infinity because we basically solve the, the, the maximization problem for each uh, propagation. Now, the GDN SGD says we do just one iteration for the optimization. So these are the two extremes. And one can imagine that you know, one can choose k adaptively in order to balance the cost of maximization and uh, versus forward backward propagation. And that's a very attractive idea and we're trying right now. Now, let me also mention that this, this continuous approach also gives rise to new models. So here's an example of a new model. Namely, if we go back to the, to the, uh, to the, um, uh, the flow define the ODE. Now, we can fix the probability distribution for, for the inner parameter W. And then we are left with this function A. And we use this function as the only parameter. So this expression here looks very much like the continuous version, version of random feature model. So here, we're putting the random feature model into the right-hand side of the flow. So the parameters will be just one parameter family of functions of A, and this will be the gradient, you know, one parameter family of gradient flow. And that's a new model, and we have tested this model. It seemed to perform reasonably well. And, but Obviously, there's lots of more tests to do. Okay, to conclude, if, if we um, ask, what have we really learned from machine learning? So I would say it's actually the way that we represent functions as expectations. That's really the most crucial form, cr crucial thing. Now, for example, in this talk, I discussed integral transform-based representation. That's an ex that's that expectation. So if we go back to, to here, well, here. So that's integral transform representation. And then we also discuss flow-induced representation. So this is also some form of expectation, even though only the right-hand side is expressed as expectation. So we call this flow-induced representation. So in this talk, I discussed these two. But if you can come up with an alternative representation of functions as expectations, and that might be a starting point for a new set of machine learning algorithms. So that's an attractive idea that I think uh, one can pursue. And another idea is to use different discretization. So I mentioned that, that here we're doing particle method discretization. We can do smooth particle method. We can also do spectral method. Now, spectral method is very powerful in low dimensions. So if your dimensionality is not that high, you don't have to use a particle method. Particle method in low dimension is not the best algorithm. Uh, spectral uh, discretization is much better. So these will be, uh, these kind of alternatives, alternatives are very natural from this continuous viewpoint that I've, uh, that I've presented here. But at the end of the day, from this, uh, uh, line of thinking, we find that, that neural networks actually very natural. Because if you take the simplest representations, namely integral transform based representation and flow based representation, and then you discretize with the simplest algorithm that works in high dimension, namely particle method, you recover that what people do in practice in deep learning, namely gradient descent algorithms for neural networks. So from this viewpoint, they're actually very natural. But of course, this continuous um, line of thinking allows us to think outside the box. Namely, we can think about different representations, we can think about different models, different discretizations. And that I think is a very fruitful thing to, uh, to pursue in the future. 
I'll end my stop, uh, end my talk here. Thank you very much for your attention.